it is uh, a pleasure to be able to address this topic. And it's a, in some ways uh, a difficult moment to address it because of the recent tragedy that Armenians suffered. But I'm gonna go back, I'm a historian, so into the Soviet period and talk about the way in which the Karabakh conflict began or at least was set up by Lenin's nationality policy. Those of you who've studied the Soviet Union or hopefully read some of my books will know that the Leninist policy was to give autonomy to some degree to various Soviet peoples. Let them enjoy their language, give them alphabets if they needed it, uh, a degree of autonomy, allow a certain cultural nationalism, some local autonomy in decision-making, but without real full political sovereignty. Whatever it said in the constitution, these were not sovereign states within the Soviet Union. The Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic was one of 15 under the dominance of Moscow. This was, as Salpi put it, an empire, uneven empire dominated by the Central Communist Party. Now within that, Karabakh was a kind of exception. It was an autonomous region within Azerbaijan even though its overwhelming majority of the population, 90% when it joined, 75% by the time of the conflict in the 90s, uh, Karabakh was an exception in that it really never had any autonomy. Uh, there was some cultural development of Armenians there, but it was always limited by Baku. And Karabakhsis knew well as they were losing their language and uh, uh, felt discriminated against, not fully enjoying even national rights as supposedly guaranteed by the Leninist of, uh, ideology. They knew that they were living maybe better than most Azerbaijanis, but far inferior to those of their compatriots across the border in the Armenian Soviet Republic, the Hayastansis. So a conflict smoldered for decades. I remember first turning to this conflict in the 1970s when a few Armenian intellectuals actually wrote a petition and tried to get Karabakh moved from Azerbaijan, where it was only a few miles from the border with Armenia into the Armenian Republic, but the Soviet government refused to do that. So smoldering conflict that then exploded, raged forth in 1998 uh, with the coming of the Gorbachev reforms, Pedestroika and Glasnost. Now you are allowed to express yourself more freely. And the Armenians, of course, who have a trouble keeping their mouth shut anyway, usually, in fact, did that in a very dynamic way. Millions, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not a million people came out into the streets, first in Stepanakert, the capital of Karabakh, and later in the streets of Yerevan, calling for the joining of Karabakh with Armenia, which only resulted in a horrendous pogrom, a, a massacre of Armenians in the little town, in the industrial town of Sumgayit, within Karabakh, within uh, Azerbaijan. And later this was followed by other uh, struggles and conflicts back and forth. The black January of January, 1990, when attacks on Armenians continued in Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, which led finally uh, during this conflict before independence of either Republic to an exchange of populations. Armenians fled from Azerbaijan to Armenia and other parts of the former Soviet Union and even abroad and Azerbaijanis were basically deported uh, uh, largely peacefully, but in trucks and forcefully to Azerbaijan where they became refugees. So we have a human rights conflict. We have a human rights uh, uh, disaster on both sides of the frontier. There are of course no purely innocent sides in any war. At one point or another, some people are victims Victims can become perpetrators, perpetrators can come, become victims. And if you study this conflict uh, uh, earlier, if you think about events like Kelbajar where our Azerbaijanis were killed, uh, there, there are events that each side will call, and they do this frequently, a genocide. There was no genocide in this war, but there was a frame, a lens through which each side came to understand the conflict. And the very word genocide, such a powerful term in international discourse, of course, precludes certain kinds of negotiation, certain kinds of accommodation, certain kinds of compromise. 
And if you went to Armenia during the time after 1994, the armistice that the Russians uh, uh, brokered in this area, when the Armenians were victorious and when they occupied a good part of Azerbaijan inside and outside of Karabakh, you would have met a, a population and a leadership that was generally not willing to compromise. And of course, it was very difficult to compromise because on the other side, the Azerbaijanis who had been defeated were unwilling to give up Karabakh or their own claims. So this grew into a war between two newly independent nation states, Armenia and Azerbaijan, and with a third actor, the Autonomous Republic of Mountainous Karabakh. Now, bringing this to the question of human rights, we have here a deep conflict between two principles. On the one hand, the Wilsonian or Leninist principle that was in fact guaranteed by the Soviets supposedly of national self-determination. An ethnic or national uh, cultural population has the right to rule itself, to have representation and protect its civil, human and cultural rights. But that conflict of national self-determination came after, particularly after the fall of the Soviet Union in conflict with another international principle, which often trumped national uh, self-determination. And that is the principle of territorial integrity. So one principle, national self-determination helped and favored the Armenians. The other principle, territorial integrity favored the Azerbaijanis. And as I said, not only between these two principles, but both, neither side was really willing to compromise. Now, Armenia had won that war in the 1990s. It benefited from the armistice of 1994 that had been brokered by Yeltsin's Russia. But Armenians sadly did not take advantage, maybe as much advantage, maybe they couldn't, of the victorious position that they found themselves to find a solution to the conflict. And they were met by harsh resistance by defeated Azerbaijan. In the meantime, in the last two decades, Azerbaijan grew richer and stronger. It was aided by various allies, most importantly, Erdogan's Turkey, uh, was assisted by the Israeli uh, arms exports of very effective drones, and Azerbaijan, as Salpi mentioned, won the war, the brief war in 2020. The saddest thing, and I'll conclude with this, is that a popular democracy was defeated by a repressive dictatorial state, which is now gloating, which is happy in its humiliation of its democratic neighbor. And not, un not perfectly understandably then, for Armenians all over the world, and particularly in Hayastan, in Armenia, chaos has been followed by despair about the future of our democracy. <laughs>